not achieve well, who bring problems with them to school. So I, mean, I think innovation, in fact, is something that, uh, as it's been conceptualized, uh, is actually becoming part of the problem rather than part of the solution. We may be innovating our way to failure. Um, <laughs> I've been involved in school reform and innovation my entire career. There have been many wonderful innovations. Many of them are actually represented in this room. I saw friends of mine from New Tech High and there's school strategies, the Asia Society. There are so many um, that uh, have uh, been, have been and are wonderful and are making a huge contribution. Uh, but one of the things we do in the United States is that we're masters of innovation. And we have become very poor at building systems in which we scale up what works and make sure it's readily available to all kids. Uh, and so uh, we have what I call popcorn reform and sort of zigzag policy. Anybody who is as old as I am who's been in public education, I started as a teacher in 1973, one of those women for whom at that time it was you know, people of color and women at that time, that was more than half of the uh, pathway into any career. Um, but anybody who's been in education that long has started successful schools. I've started schools that are charters, private schools, and public schools. I've helped to found um, a variety of programs. I've worked with districts and, and uh, states to put in place various reforms. Many of them have been extremely successful. They've dramatically improved achievement, raised graduation rates. And like many others of you here, though many of those uh, places, programs, uh, and reforms have disappeared since. We don't stick with things that work. Uh, and that is part of our problem. We've got to learn how to make the right investments and stay with them. If you look at high achieving countries around the world, and I talk about this in uh, the flat world, uh, Singapore, Finland, uh, Korea are three that I highlight that were low achieving and inequitable in their outcomes back in 1970 when we were first in the world in education. They are now at the top of the rankings uh, in terms of achievement, in terms of graduation rates, and even in terms of college going rates where they surpass us uh, on all of those indicators. Korea is a very poor country. Singapore is a multicultural, multiracial country with many minority groups. Uh, these are not just homogeneous places that kind of magically create good schools. What have they done? They've built systems. They have equitably funded their schools, number one, and put more money in the schools where the kids with higher needs. They have a well-functioning childhood safety net. Kids are fed. They are housed. They are uh, taken care of in terms of health care. They have a readily available early childhood support. Uh, sometimes it's preschool, sometimes it's early childhood care. They've invested in teacher education and development. In Finland, Singapore, Korea, if you want to become a teacher, uh, you will get a three or four year teacher education program completely free of charge with a salary or a stipend while you train. Uh, that will provide you with a deep knowledge base about how to teach all kids well. In fact, Finland focuses on how you teach special education students. Uh, it will prepare you to teach uh, kids to speak two or three languages. So language development is not a deficit proposition. It's what everybody does. It will prepare you to be a good assessor of formative uh, assessment as well as summative performance assessments that are rich representations of kids' abilities to inquire and learn in the way that 21st century jobs demand. Uh, and it will then bring you into a career where you're paid as well as engineers uh, and other professionals uh, where you get ongoing professional learning opportunities. 25 hours a week is not uncommon for time to learn plus 100 hours a year of professional learning and so on. They have assessments that are focused on higher order thinking and performance skills. None of these are countries where multiple choice tests are used, uh, not to mention they don't dominate. Uh, they have open-ended assessments that ask kids to demonstrate what they can do, to think and perform. They score those. Teachers are involved in that. They're focused on the kind of learning that is going to leave our kids in the dust. And finally, they have a lean common curriculum. Uh, so that in all of those cases, one of the big reforms they did was to minimize and reduce tracking and to get kids more engaged in a common path towards high levels of achievement. Now, we're doing some of these things. Common Core standards are coming online. What happens to those is still uh, a question. There's some movement in the direction of better assessments. Uh, but uh, we have still 
a lot of the challenges of our zigzag pal policy path, uh, our popcorn reform, and the biggest problem, which is inequality. W.B. Du Bois said uh, in the early 1900s that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Despite the fact that we have elected our first African-American president, uh, something I worked very hard to do and many others of you in this room uh, may also have done, uh, we cannot move beyond that saying yet. We can, I think, currently say that the problem of the 21st century continues to be, in many respects, the color line. Uh, Rick pointed out, and I agree with him, that the achievement gap is not necessarily the best way to frame the issue, but we do have an opportunity gap. And the opportunity gap we have to confront. Uh, it has grown worse since 1980. In 1975, uh, at the, by the end of the 70s, with all of the reforms that Kennedy and Johnson put in place, we actually had a smaller achievement gap at the end of the 1970s than we have today. We had African American, Latino, and white students going to college at exactly the same rates. That was not true before, it was not true since. Uh, we had a, a, a poverty rate for children that it was about half of what it is today. Uh, all of those policies were pushed back in the 1980s and eliminated or reduced, uh, and now we have a quarter of our kids in poverty, uh, we have uh, huge income in inequalities, and then we fund the schools where kids come from the neediest backgrounds less well. Uh, the top spending districts in this country spend 10 times what the bottom spending districts spend in any given state. It's about a three to one ratio. Perhaps one of the most successful reforms is what was done in New Jersey, where after 30 years of litigation, they finally em enacted parity funding, where Newark and Trenton and other uh, uh, high minority, low income communities were given funding at the same level as Princeton and New Brunswick, which they had fought 30 years to prevent uh, from happening. And they put in place high quality preschool for all uh, children in those communities. They put in place a literacy program with professional development and coaching and so on, and they cut the achievement gap in half. New Jersey is one of the top five achieving countries in the nation on every NAEP indicator. Number one in writing, it is 45% people of color. It is more than 30% uh, low income. Uh, it is a state where the average African American and Latino student outscores the average kid in California. Uh, because they took a systemic approach to beginning to tackle these problems. So what do we need to do? Uh, and what should philanthropists uh, uh, consider? That's I think perfect time. Perfect, perfect I was time. trying not to look at you, Ken. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> perfect time. Uh, we need to uh, really pursue equity policy. Uh, that means making the kinds of, there are 44 states with school funding lawsuits right now. Every state has its state bird, its state flag, and its state school finance lawsuit. <laughs> and those, we have to find a way in this country, the home of opportunity, the land of equality, to make educational equality real. Now money doesn't solve all problems and money can be wasted and it can be misspent and we can talk more about that, but you have to, put in place the resources in schools that now don't have qualified teachers, don't have texts and materials, don't have the basics of education to allow kids to get what they need to succeed. We also need preschool. It's a crime that the United States of America still does not have universal preschool available to all families. It's ridiculous. We can put a man on the moon, we can't provide. A third of the gap between rich and poor kids and achievement exists at the beginning of school. And two-thirds occurs because of summer learning loss in the summer, because during the school year, the uh, achievement trends are about parallel between kids and rich and poor kids. Uh, so we need those summer school opportunities for all kids. We need to invest in new assessments. We need to build a teacher and leader development system where every educator has access to the knowledge and skills they need to do the job they want to do on behalf of kids. Uh, and where they are supported throughout the career in getting more and more sophisticated and skillful in their work. We need school designs that work, uh, and those are some of the kind of innovations that many people have been involved in creating, but those have to be scaled up and made part of the general system, not at the margins. We need a more productive accountability system 
Standards will not teach themselves, uh, and we need new assessments. Uh, philanthropists can think about their contributions to this by, number one, investing in the long haul. Don't make grants that have a three-year time frame and then, oh, we gave you three years of money, you're supposed to be self-sufficient, we're going away. That's popcorn reform. Uh, we need uh, people who will carry the ball over the finish line. Uh, think systems. Uh, think about how to build the policy and uh, practice infrastructure together. Evaluate and disseminate uh, good practice. When you've done something worth doing, don't just walk away from it. Make sure that people understand it. If it worked, why did it work? What would be needed to allow it to work elsewhere? And how are other people going to get access to that knowledge? Fourth, build state and local capacity. Think about how to build uh, places where the work can continue because the people who are running the work are smart about it and where the resources are in place. Finally, keep equity in mind. Uh, Martin Luther King said to his own children years ago, I will do all I can to get you a good education, but you must never forget those who cannot get today a good education because you cannot be all that you should be until they become all that they can be. Thank you. All right. Just have eye contact, Rick. Uh, <laughs> uh, minute and a half, two minutes to uh, to react to what you uh, what you heard Linda say, and then we'll do the same thing with Linda. Tough baby. Uh, Tough man. All right. Uh, really, three key points. One, we heard Linda point to some of the international evidence. Uh, we heard her also talk, say, about New Jersey. Um, I think the problem with the way we talk about this, for instance, if any of you have ever read Matt Ladner at the Goldwater Institute, has done the same kind of stuff with Florida, points out that Latino students in Florida outperform those in California and elsewhere. Problem is we play this game where we look at folks who are high performing, we cherry pick the stuff that kind of is consistent with our view of the world, the programs that we seem to like, and then we say, do those. You know, it's a little bit like when McKinsey or Bain go out and help a corporation. It's not like, you know, half those companies get their money's worth and half wind up having wasted millions on these harebrained consultants. And it's not like McKinsey saves the good ideas for, the guy, for some guys. They give the same advice to everybody. Problem is sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So I just, I call this kind of the tip of the iceberg fallacy. I'm not opposed in principle to school turnarounds or differentiate instruction. If you think about small high schools, though, think about Tom Tock's book seven or eight years ago, uh, Schools on a, human, uh, on a Human Scale. You know, we focus on the small high school bit, for instance. Uh, my friends at Gates, your predecessors, used to talk about it like this when we would chat. But what's easy to miss is the six-sevenths of the iceberg that we don't talk about, the fact that you're getting waivers around the collective bargaining agreement, the fact that you're hiring new staff, the fact that you've got additional resources, the fact that families are choosing to be in these school programs. So what happens a lot of time is we look at particular high-performing states or countries, we focus on a couple things that, that, that Michael Barmer noticed last time he was having drinks with somebody, and we maybe missed the rest of the iceberg. <laughs> Second, uh, I, think, I agree completely with Linda's point on summer, three thinking, three thinking say summer. Summer learning loss is a huge deal. Uh, sometimes we hear that we have the school calendar we do because it's agrarian, and that's actually not true. We have the school calendar we do because Massachusetts, which was a cradle of American education, was trying to make sure that it got kids out of the cities in the summertime because it was unsafe and unsanitary to have uh, youth and teachers convene. There was no air conditioning. There was sewage in the streets. They wanted to get kids, whoever possible, out in the countryside. It's actually the reverse now. Having these vulnerable children in a place like New Orleans on the street for three months is actually much less conducive to their health than being in an effective school environment. This is not a question, to my mind, of we need extended learning time in terms of the day or the year universally. What we need to do is create leeway around amusement park laws and around statutory requirements that allow districts and schools to operate on the calendar and the schedule that are going to meet the needs of their kids. Third, uh, Linda made, I thought, a terrific point on popcorn reform. Just one thing I would suggest here. This is one of the interesting disagreements Linda and I have. I, I disagree with her fundamentally on the system reform point. Not because I don't think it's systems that matter, but because the average lifespan for a Fortune 500 company in the USA, 50 years from inception to dissolution. Three quarters.